Well, welcome everybody, um, and good evening. I think we'll get started. Um, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you here to the uh, Spring WEN uh, Chair in Conservation Public Lecture. It's the second one in a series, which I hope we'll see someone someday saying welcome to the 50th uh, public lecture from the WEN Chair in Conservation. Uh, I'm going to keep my first remarks very short. My only job is to introduce the Vice Chancellor of the University of Western Australia, Amit Shakma. Good evening, uh, Kaya Wangju. Uh, thank you, Jessica. She says on the job. You know, she's one of the stars of this evening. <laughs> so that's uh, probably the most important job. Well, I begin uh, by acknowledging that our beautiful campus is uh, situated on the traditional lands of the Wajuk Noongar people. And uh, I pay my respect to elders, past, present, and emerging. And I also acknowledge that uh, members of our community are suffering uh, as a result of uh, the recent referendum. And uh, I have urged our colleagues, university community, uh, to uh, look up to each other in these uh, trying times. And we will uh, recover from it, but we need uh, to look up to each other, support each other. So, uh, Coming to this event's uh, occasion, uh, this is a happy occasion for us. Uh, universities exist uh, for the kind of things that we're going to learn about tonight. But I want to provide uh, with a little bit of context on you know, how this lecture came about. But these sort of things happen, they're wonderful things, but they don't happen by accident. A lot of work goes into it. And this is one of those happy occasions for me to share a little bit of uh, background to this. So Jessica will just uh, uh, open the lecture, uh, the formal part of the lecture, uh, is a wonderful colleague. I uh, have been working on uh, marine conservation for a number of years. But uh, recently, you know, we are fortunate enough to uh, get uh, support from the Wen family. Uh, the Wens are with us uh, this evening uh, uh, to fund an endowed chair. Okay, so those of you who are uh, not familiar with uh, academic uh, you know, way of operating. Uh, we uh, are a public institution. Uh, we uh, receive most of our funding from government and student fees. Now, some of it, of course, student loans. Uh, and uh, over the years, over the years, when I say we, all universities, public universities, over the years, the balance uh, has shifted. So students pay more at one point in time, long time ago. Uh, education is free at this university. Uh, one of the uh, universities that provide, uh, uh, probably the only university at one point in time in the British Empire that provided free education. So that's where we begin. Now students are asked to pay more. But even with that, uh, you know, the expenditure side doesn't keep up with the revenue side. So for a university like us uh, pursuing uh, research at the frontiers, we need help. And one source of help is philanthropy. And all the great universities benefit from philanthropy. Uh, philanthropic uh, concept is an evolving concept in this country. You know, quite advanced in the United States, but we are making progress. So endowed chair is one of those concepts where uh, donors uh, you know, generously donate funds. Uh, they go into endowment. And we continue to maintain that endowment in perpetuity and the endowment funds chairs, scholarships, and whatnot. So quick uh, background to the one family chair in conservation. And as part of that, uh, you know, uh, so chair is not just an individual, uh, you know, but chair has programmed research activities. And obviously, we want to disseminate the work that goes on. But it's not just the work of the chair, the research work that covers you know, the areas of interest to the chair. So this is that uh, venue, if you will, uh, spring public lecture. And I'd like to acknowledge other supporters who have contributed. Of course, uh, when giving is the when family's uh, philanthropic arm, Forest Research Foundation, the Jock Clough Marine Foundation, and our own Oceans Institute. So you can see that we have the making of a cluster of academic endeavors, you know, focusing on 
conservation in the marine sciences and whatnot. So let me uh, thank uh, the WENS again for their vision, foresight, and generous support in partnering with our university and uh, creating this uh, WEN Chair in Conservation. And Jessica Maywick, uh, Professor Maywick, is the first holder of the chair. So the idea of the chair is really to take knowledge, research knowledge, uh, and make it available to governments and other organizations, private sector, not for profit, so that they can put that knowledge to good use. In this particular case, very likely through a change in policy or policy or practices. So uh, the, the chair uh, that we are celebrating in a way through this lecture essentially takes fundamental knowledge and allows for that to be applied. So conservation measures that uh, we are able to take today will have impact well into the future, will serve the needs of our current and future generation, and hopefully, you know, will make our planet a more, I guess, sustainable one, whenever you all want to be sustained. And the focus of the uh, chair uh, is very fitting, uh, marine conservation, given our location and some of the other branches of the university's efforts that uh, we have, uh, uh, I have outlined. As uh, the inaugural WEN Chair in Conservation, uh, Professor Miwig is building on more than a decade of conservation research and data collection in remote ocean spaces, not only in our part of the world, but across the world. And from time to time, she gets into other sort of difficulties. Uh, you know, before I met Professor Mewig, uh, I got a letter from some diplomat or some country somewhere, you know, taking issue with our activities, all all what all legal activities, but the country is challenging. So, so from time to time, she does get uh, gets into you know hot water, uh, all legal from our perspective. Uh, and uh, the other side of it is. Uh, from time to time, we had the advice of don't travel to that country. Who knows what might happen? Uh, we are very proud uh, to be hosting that chair. And this continues a proud tradition. Our founder, Sir Winter Hackett, established. When our university established some 112 years ago, 13 years ago, uh, the founder also ended out our first chair the Hackett Chair in Agriculture. And we continue that tradition. Uh, over the years, we have created a number of chairs. Uh, early in our journey, you know, uh, we got lucky. Uh, we are small, we are generously funded by government, research uh, enterprise was relatively small, so we didn't need as much. But as the university expanded, research grew, uh, we needed more support. So that support has become very, very important. Over the last uh, couple of years, three years actually, 20, we started in 2020, we, we started a new program of creating endowed chairs. I'm delighted to tell you that we have now created 10 endowed chairs, one chair being one of them. Just to give you a flavor of the areas we cover, uh, our chairs cover the areas uh, like cardiovascular, optometry, child health, stroke, marine biology, like this one, arthritis, business ethics and biological chemistry, uh, and we hope to grow that. So all these chairs are held by, or to, will be held by, you know, great scholars, and they'll make significant contributions. So you can see the diversity of the areas our chairs cover and the impact uh, that we make. So this means that Western Australia will have expertise in some of the areas that uh, I have outlined, and expertise that really at the leading edge of knowledge, discovery, and dissemination. We're extremely fortunate that uh, our community has supported us, many donors, uh, friends of the university, graduates of the university, continue to support us. And I have absolutely no doubt that uh, with all that support and all the good work our colleagues are doing, we'll continue to make significant contributions, not only to Western Australia, but uh, to the world. And on behalf of the university, I would like to thank uh, the WENS once again for your generous support and uh, the impact uh, your support will have 
on this university and uh, the environmental issues that we just uh, described. I just uh, want to express my delight to see so many young people here, and I assume that most of you are students. When one gets old, you know, a lot of people look young. I make the mistake of considering everybody student. So whether students or not, uh, I'm just thrilled to see so many of you, uh, you know, joining us for this lecture. I know you have other things you could have done. This is a good practice. Please keep it up. Well, for the rest of us, please enjoy the rest of the evening and we look forward to hearing our lecture. So um, it might be worth noting that the uh, Australian High Commissioner to the country that will remain nameless is actually within this audience. So I wasn't quite sure what to make out of that story. Uh, it is, however, true. Um, so what I wanted to do is uh, just briefly talk about why are we having a WEN chair in Conservation Public Lecture Series. And from the very first time I met um, May and Chi Chi, they said, all right, what's the difference you're going to make? How are you going to move the dial? What's the impact? It's impact is the number one word that rises up in almost every con conversation that we have. And part of having impact is communicating and, and doing things like this. And I thought, well, nobody wants to listen to me twice a year, apart from my students, who, of course, delighted to. Um, so I thought, well, the best thing you can do is, is to make sure that people, um, my colleagues from around the world who, have, who are, in fact, having high impact, have the opportunity to come out here and we have the opportunity to listen to them and share stories. I should say this is a rather unusual program because they don't just come for a lecture. They give workshops, um, which Dr. Freelander will do two of this week. Um, and then they have to come and spend a week with me writing an impact paper. So it's a bit of a punishment sting in the tail as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to just flag in, um, uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Chakma said, talked about our donors. One of the things that I found so exciting about this program is the support that we've had from the Oceans Institute, from the Forest Research Foundation, from the Doc Clough Moon Foundation. Um, all these organizations that are saying, hey, this is worth investing our very precious dollars in to make sure that we can get top people out here and for enough time. So on that note, I will now give you um, Alan's biography with a few little additional points from myself. So over the past 40 years, Alan Friedlander has spent over 12,000 hours um, in the water, so he's truly a bit soaked and soggy. Um, from coral reefs to the poles and to the depths of thousands of meters. And in fact, in the workshop yesterday, he happened to casually mention, oh yeah, we're upgrading our submarine. So I now have sub NV as well. Um, Alan is the chief scientist for National Geographic Society's Pristine Seas Program and a researcher at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, which is at the University of Hawaii. Um, he started his career in the early 1980s on small-scale fisheries in the kingdom of Tonga. Um, he knows the Pacific. Following that, he obtained a, a master's in oceanography from Old Dominion University, which is in Virginia, which focused on the coastal fisheries in Puerto Rico. He then moved to work for the Territorial Fisheries Agency and the National Park Service in the U.S. Virgin Islands, and that's where we met 35 years ago. I was a newly minted undergraduate with an honors degree, working for the British Virgin Islands Department of Conservation Fisheries as their conservation biologist. We had a huge hurricane come through, wiped out all the roads, and the World Bank said, we'll give you money to repair your roads if you do a mangrove survey. And I said, what's a mangrove? Kid you not. So I called up our colleagues in the US Virgin Islands, and um, Alan was volunteered to assist this young Canadian biologist working across the, um, the canal uh, on doing mangrove surveys. Um, I will note that I was chased out by feral donkeys while I was doing those. Um, so he, from there, he went on to receive his PhD from the University of Hawaii and was a National Research Council postdoctoral associate. Alan currently leads the research efforts to help understand and conserve iconic special places in the ocean and is an expert in marine ecology, fisheries, and conservation, and including understanding traditional knowledge and how that interplays with um, our management of our oceans. And that's where I met Alan again, because in 2014, I got a phone call that said, hey, I hear you got these groovy ca um, camera systems that count fish in the midwater. Want to come to Palau? I'm like, oh, I got to check my calendar and my schedule. Anyway, we went to Palau, and uh, that started now a nearly 10-year program between Christine Seas and the University of Western Australia. That's included the 
um, PhD uh, scholarship for Dr. Chris Thompson, who's now a postdoc working with this, a research fellow working with the CNCs, and so on we go. So, um, Alan's work on marine protected areas ranges from small locally community managed areas to some of the largest protected areas on the planet. And this is where we get to impact. Over the last um, decade, Alan has led 40 expeditions to some of the most remote places on the planet. Pitcairn, Ascension, Trist, uh, Tristan? Yes, Tristan de Kuna, um, and so forth. And the research that they've done there and the communication outputs that they've driven has helped create 26 uh, large marine protected areas encompassing over six and a half million square kilometers of our oceans. So that's a lot of impact. Um, Alan is a fellow of the Royal Geographic Society, fellow of the Explorers Club, and along with the National Geographic Christine Seas team was awarded the 2014 Environmental Hero Award by the Environmental Media Association and the 2016 Crystal Compass National Award from the Russian Geographical Society. Um, He's done a heck of a lot. He's going to share not just the adventures, but the science and the research that's had such a big impact on our oceans. We'll take questions at the end. And with that, I'll turn it over to Alan. Good evening, everybody. Aloha kaha from Hawaii. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're on this evening. And I'd also like to thank the Wen family for the invitation, University of Western Australia. And first and foremost, my dear colleague, Jessica Merwig, for inviting me here. Um, and let's get to it, I guess. Um, OK, so we look at the ocean, and it's vast, and it's featureless, and it seems remote. Yet life on Earth wouldn't exist without the ocean. Uh, it produces half the oxygen we breathe. Uh, absorbs 50 times the amount of carbon than land does, uh, regulates our climate, you name it, we wouldn't be here without the ocean. Uh, it provides food, primary source of protein for over a billion people globally, uh, livelihoods for tens of millions of people, particularly in developing countries. Uh, it's the greatest treasure trove of higher level biodiversity on the planet. It, twice as many phyla exist in the ocean as exist on land. 12 file are exclusive to the ocean only. And also very important culturally, cultural connections to lots of communities around the world need healthy ocean. Recreation, everybody likes to recreate in the ocean. And finally, shoreline protection, particularly in the face of climate change. So hopefully you recognize that we wouldn't be here without a healthy ocean. However, despite the importance of oceans and healthy oceans, um, We've abused them pretty dramatically over time. Uh, very few places on the earth are spared from huge human impacts, primarily North Atlantic and Mediterranean. Most of Southeast Asia are the most impacted places we see on earth. But if you look on this map, there's most of the planet has a significant human footprint to it. Okay, so the gradients of human impact affect what it looks like underwater. You go to a pristine place, some of the things I'll talk about through this talk, and you'll see vibrant communities full of large fish and healthy reefs. As we move on to greater human impacts, um, we start to see the absence of some things, large predators, elements of the ecosystem start to get degraded. But as we go to that extreme right-hand side of the figure, it's pretty much death by a thousand cuts. Uh, between overfishing, coastal development, pollution, sedimentation, you name it. Um, the ecosystem doesn't function like it should. The wheels have essentially come off, and the ecosystem doesn't provide the benefits to humanity that it should and that we expect of a healthy ecosystem. Okay, so there's lots of solutions out there, and we need multiple solutions. Sustainable fisheries management, marine managed areas, restoration, Pollution reduction, climate change, OECMs, other effective conservation measures that essentially refers to community-based management areas. But by far and away, marine protected areas are our best tool that we can use to manage healthy oceans. Marine protected areas are a very simple concept. If you don't fish in an area, you don't have any impacts in an area, you're going to have more fish, more other resource species, and they're going to grow bigger. 
Uh, so there's obvious biodiversity benefits by not fishing and not having other impacts within an area. That's easy. The other one's a little more not intuitive, um, and those are the fisheries benefits that we get from marine protected areas. There's two ways that marine protected areas benefit fisheries. One is through adult spillover, density dependence. You get a lot of animals inside that protected area, start to elbow each other out. They swim out and they can get caught. But more importantly, animals in protected areas tend to be much larger than outside, and they have a greater reproductive output. So a fish twice as big as another fish doesn't produce twice as many eggs. It produces 10 times as many eggs. So that added benefit of having large animals is really important to that egg production and um, enhanced reproductive output. And that's where you get the biggest bang for your buck for a marine protected area. Okay, as Jessica mentioned, I started my career in the early 1980s, a long time ago. Um, I had hair back then and was much, much younger. But um, I worked on small-scale fisheries in the Kingdom of Tonga in a small, remote island. And it's there, spending lots of days and nights at sea with the fishermen, I really learned and recognized the importance of healthy oceans to these people. But also just the incredible wealth of knowledge that exists within these communities about the natural rhythms and processes that exist that, you know, make the ocean work. And so at that point, I've spent the last 40 years trying to support these efforts for sustainable, healthy oceans, uh, leading, you know, for perpetuity, hopefully. Okay, um, another epiphany I had was when I was working up in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands in the late 1990s. So uh, what is now the Papanao Mukuakea Marine National Monument, a million and a half square kilometers, the largest no-take marine protected area in the world. But uh, working up there uh, before the creation of the monument, um, these are uninhabited islands and atolls that stretch for a thousand plus kilometers to the northwest of the main Hawaiian Islands. You can really have this comparison between what Hawaii looks like with and without people. And the first thing you notice when you jump in the water in the northwest Hawaiian Islands is that you are not at the top of the food chain. Uh, there are lots of big sharks, primarily Galapagos, gray reef sharks, large schools of giant trevally, the critically endangered endemic Hawaiian monk seal. Uh, it's the only place I know of where you can be surrounded by several dozen of Galapagos sharks and then a big herd of large giant trevally come through and all the sharks scatter. So it's really life on the edge and that's what it looks like in predator dominated systems. And, and that really should be the norm, but we've lost that. Um, some of the seminal work that we did um, that helped in the creation of Papanao Mokuakea was this work comparing and contrasting what the fish assemblages look like in the main Hawaiian Islands versus the uninhabited northwestern Hawaiian Islands. So you can see from here, um, proportional bubbles there. Uh, overall fish biomass is three to four times greater in the northwest Hawaiian Islands than the main Hawaiian Islands. But the really important thing to note here is half of the biomass consists of large predators, that sharks and jacks and groupers and things that have pretty much been extirpated from most ecosystems. Only 3% of the biomass in the main one island consists of these top predators. This is the first example of what we now refer to as an inverted biomass pyramid where you can have more predators than prey in an ecosystem. Again, another counterintuitive thing, but by having these large predators, they cause turnover in the ecosystem, so they tend to be more resilient. If you're a prey, you live fast and die young in a predator-dominated system, but that's building in that resilience in the system, and that's more of the natural state, yet is rare these days. Okay, so as a result of the importance of the oceans and the harm that's been done to it, Enrique Sala, uh, explorer and residence at National Geographic, created the Pristine Seas Program in 2008, and I've been working there since its inception, of the 42 expeditions, I think I've been on 40 of them. So to um, from pole to pole and every place in between. And these places are just incredibly inspiring. These are some of the last vestiges of what the ocean looked like before there were people. Um, it's just, um, it's really inspiring. I feel very fortunate and privileged to be able to go to these places and then report back on what they look like, inspire other people. Uh, we've been very productive with a small team of scientists. We've produced a large number of publications, numerous papers in science and nature, and 
other high impact journals um, with a small group of people, lots of documentary films, but most importantly has been the creation of 26 large marine protected areas accounting for six and a half million square kilometers of some of the last wild places in the ocean. Um, prior to the creation of pristine seas, we did some work in the northern line islands um, to kind of compare what we had found in Hawaii. Uh, a lot of people said what we found is anomalous. You know, you can't have these predator-dominant systems. They're not common. And so we went to uh, Palmyra and Kingman, which are part of the U.S., and then um, Christmas and Fanning, which are part of the nation of Kiribati. So Christmas, a Kiribati island, the other Christmas island, not yours, um, has about 8,000 people on it. Tabueran or Fanning, 2,500 people. Palmyra on a good day, maybe 10. And Kingman doesn't have any emergent land, so zero people on there. So it sets up this nice contrast between people and their people. And again, you know, these are some of the most intact, pristine coral reef ecosystems we've seen anywhere, dominated by large predators. These predators exert, a, um, you know, strong top-down control on the entire ecosystem. Um, and this should be the norm, yet these ecosystems tend to be rarer and rarer as time goes on. But this is what they're supposed to look like. And so in that upper panel there, the fishes is a similar trend to what we saw for Hawaii. Um, when we've got no people, you've got lots of fish, which is dominated by predators, mainly sharks and jacks and groupers and so forth. And as you move towards more people, the overall fish biomass decreases and the predators pretty much drop out of the ecosystem. Likewise for corals and CCA, which is crustose coralline algae, that's the pink stuff that holds the reef together. It's also important settlement habitat for corals, so you need to have CCA on the reef if you want to have healthy corals and coral reefs. Likewise, um, you know, there's a lot more coral in CCA where there's no people that declines fairly dramatically as you get to have more people in the ecosystem. Conversely, algae, macroalgae and turf algae increase from no people to where there are people. And likewise, bacteria and viruses increase when we have more people in the ecosystem and particularly uh, opportunistic pathogenetic viruses and uh, bacteria. Even with a modest number of people, only eight to 10,000 people at Christmas Island, they can have a significant impact, not just on the fisheries, but on the entire ecosystem from things that you can't even see, like bacteria and viruses, all the way up to the largest animals in the ocean. Okay, a little bit closer to home for you all, uh, the Seychelles in the Indian Ocean. Um, Several years ago, the uh, Seychelles government went into a debt for nature swap um, with the World Bank and the uh, Club of Paris. And what they did was they created the Aldabra uh, Marine National Monument, 400,000 square kilometers in exchange for giving up some of their uh, national governmental debt. Um, and again, this sets up another example of how we can look at these remote uninhabited islands versus the populated islands to the north of Mahe and Prilin and Ladig. Um, so, some of the most um, pristine ecosystems left in the Indian Ocean, um, dominated by large predators, these potato cod here can, were abundant. Those, these animals can live to be 50 plus years in age. So you can imagine in most places where they're removed from the ecosystem, it takes a long time to regenerate their biomass. But they're super abundant down in the Aldabra Archipelago and just a sign of a healthy ecosystem. Likewise, um, black tip reef sharks, you could walk across the black tip reef sharks in the lagoon in Aldabra, it's so, so abundant. And again, this should be the norm, but have been removed from most ecosystems and are very abundant in this whole archipelago. So definitely something that was worth protecting. Uh, likewise, the endemic uh, Aldabra tortoise is the world's second largest tortoise after the Galapagos tortoises. Um, they've been extirpated from throughout the Indian Ocean for the most part due to hunting. The Aldabra um, giant tortoise almost went to extinction as well, along with the other ones. Right now, there's 100,000 Galapagos tortoises, I'm sorry, Aldabra tortoises in the archipelago. So it's pretty amazing to see these lumbering animals crawling all over the place. Likewise, um, you know, corals and coral reefs are very sensitive to climate change. And in 1998, there was a large warming event 
uh, in the Indian Ocean. Many of the coral reefs died. The reefs at Aldebra and the archipelago there seem to have either re um, became resilient to or resistant to this warming event. And that's a sign of hope for me that some of these reefs, particularly remote reefs, if you take care of those local stressors, will be able to recover from climate change. So what do we see in the Seychelles? Um, in places that aren't protected from fishing, fish biomass is quite low, as you see on the left-hand side of the curve there, and almost no predators in the population, the, the red portion of those stat bars. Even in marine protected areas, you see a modest increase in fish biomass, and a few more predators show up. Even in no-take marine protected areas, uh, we see increases of biomass relative to fished areas and a couple more predators, but they pale in comparison to what these remote places look like. Um, the predator biomass is an order of magnitude of what we see elsewhere in the Seychelles, and the overall biomass is dramatically greater. So if we didn't have those remote places, we wouldn't have a baseline. We'd think our marine protected areas and their no-take areas were doing quite well because they're doing better than the areas open to fishing. Yet um, we need these critical baselines because they tell us how far we've strayed from what the natural state really is. Okay, um, back to the Pacific Ocean a little bit. Um, so 900 kilometers off the coast of Chile are the Desventurada or unfortunate islands. And although they're fairly close to continental South America, the fish populations and the whole community look nothing like what's on the continent. The Humboldt Current is a strong biogeographic barrier. This cold water current that's making its way up the South American continent pretty much precludes any exchange of species between the continent and these islands. It's as far east as you can get in the Pacific, so it's really the last vestige of what Indo-Pacific fish and communities look like. Um, in fact, every fish that you see here, even that lobster, that lobster's endemic. It's got almost a year larval duration, so it's swimming around in the larvae for a year, yet it's endemic to these islands only. Even the kelp species that you see here is endemic just to these islands, so incredibly unique ecosystem. And what we found for the fish is incredibly high biodiversity um, from the endemism standpoint. So 72 to 88 percent of the species are found nowhere else on Earth. But more importantly, endemics tend to be overrepresented in the communities. Once you become established as an endemic in some place, you tend to proliferate. You've figured it out. You know how the ecosystem works and you become dominant. Um, so these are some of the most unique ecosystems on Earth and hence global biodiversity hotspot. Um, I would also say that uh, southwestern Australia has a huge proportion of endemic species, so any marine conservation planning that's taking place should consider the fact that you've got a large number of endemic species that are essentially irreplaceable. Okay, let's go to the bottom of the world now, so uh, Cape Horn and Isla de los Estados. And this is the confluence of the three great oceans, the Pacific, the Atlantic, and the Great Southern Ocean. And as a result, it's um, you know some of the harshest ocean conditions found anywhere on the planet. Giant waves, nuclear gale force winds occur quite regularly. Um, and in fact, before the creation of the Panama Canal, this was the fastest but most treacherous way to get from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. Hundreds of ships, thousands of people lost their lives trying to round Cape Horn. So it's an incredibly harsh place. Yet it also has some of the last intact and healthiest kelp forests on the planet. Um, the rich and turbulent waters of the Cape Horn archipelago and around the southern tip of South America is just a perfect environment for kelp to grow. Um, kelp is the fastest growing plant in the world. It grows a half a meter a day. Um, and it creates this incredible three-dimensional structure that harbors amazing biodiversity. So some of the last intact, just amazing kelp forests are in there. It looks like a cathedral. It's from 30 meters down all the way up to the surface. You see these beautiful kelp forests. And, and they harbor an incredible biodiversity. They're the basis of the entire food web. They create this three-dimensional structure that um, creates a lot of biodiversity and a lot of interesting different behaviors, myriad different species. This is um, a potting of juvenile false king crab. 
we don't even know why they do this. They're sub-adults, so it's not for spawning or you know, reproductive purposes. So anytime you go to places, particularly you know, remote places that haven't been studied before, you're always finding new things and new behaviors. Um, a day sail from Cape Horn is, are the Diego Ramirez Islands. And this is the last bit of land before you hit uh, Antarctica. These are also the last kelp forests in the world. Um, we conducted the first scientific surveys there ever underwater. So it's always cool to be go to a place knowing that you're the first people to ever jump in the water at this place. There's a, a couple of Chilean naval officers who get stuck there for four months rotations at a time. So we talked to these guys and um, they had incredibly good weather. And they said, you didn't get the best day of the year, you got the best day of the decade. Because they said it's never like this. Um, so we spent a couple of days there swimming around. It was just, it was pretty spectacular. But also, um, the most southern breeding population of albatross anywhere in the world. These are uh, black browed albatross. These are juveniles sitting on their, their mud nests. You can see the adults in the back there. They're much smaller. The juveniles are all still fluffed out with all their, their, their down with them. But uh, yeah, the, the symmetry of nature and the geometry of nature always blows me away as, as well. But yeah, um, so just an incredible place on land and underwater. And again, they're the most southern kelp forests in the world. So they harbor these unique communities, great diversity, extremely healthy uh, kelp forests. As a result of our expedition, um, with some help, um, we, um, the Chilean government created the Diego Ramirez Marine Park, 44,000 square kilometers, um, helped protect intact kelp forests, but also sea mounts, uh, penguins, uh, marine mammals, deep sea fish communities along the continental shelf. So um, they're still trying to work with the Chilean government to see if they can connect that all the way up to Cape Horn. But right now, that's a great start. And Chile's been a, a really, Chile's been one of the global leaders in marine conservation. They went from having almost none of their uh, areas protected to over 40% now, including the Rapa Nui Easter Island complex, Desventuradas, and also Diego de Medes. Okay, um, it's always rare to find historical data. It's even rarer to find historical data in really remote places. Um, we were fortunate enough to go to Isla de los Estados, that's the other Staten Island, um, and uh, we left out of Ushuaia in Argentina, went through the Beagle Channel, and then um, out to the extreme southeastern tip of the South American continent to Isla de los Estados. Um, it's geographically isolated, and some of the really hazardous sea conditions, and that's really limited the amount of, of scientific work that's been done there. Um, it's also the last vestiges of the Andean Mountains, so that's pretty much it before they sink into the ocean. Um, and uh, important for these southern rockhopper penguins and lots of other species like um, South American sea lions. Um, in 1973, the U.S. National Science Foundation uh, did an expedition to East Los Estados, led by Paul Dayton from Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Paul is considered one of the fathers of kelp forest ecology. And um, they, interestingly enough, they were supposed to be working in Chile, but that was about the time of the coup in 1973 when again they got disposed. disposed. And so they ended up going to Isla de los Estados instead. Um, and they conducted the first and only surveys there until our expedition in 2018. So Paul's a good colleague and a friend, and he was super excited the fact that we we're going down there. So he opened up all his old field notes and his photos and gave them to us. And um, he took meticulous notes for all the students in the audience. Um, remember about, nat don't just think about collecting quantitative data, you have to collect natural history data as well. It's very important. Because of Paul's meticulous notes um, on kelp, on sea urchins, on all the other species within those assemblages, we were able to directly replicate his surveys and go back to the exact same spots that he had surveyed 45 years previously. And we found essentially similar ecosystems to what Paul found. Um, our photographs are a little better because it was back in the day, but for the most part, the kelp looked the same, the urchin population, the whole marine community looked very similar. There's not many places in the world that you know of today where you can say 45 years later that the ecosystems look similar, similarly healthy. 
that they did. Okay, so after coral reefs, kelp is probably the most endangered ecosystem on the planet. Kelp need cold water to survive, and as the oceans get warmer and uh, ecosystems become tropicalized, we get um, kelp around the world are in trouble, and many of the kelp ecosystems are being degraded. Fortunately, and most of that um, in the northern hemisphere, in the North Pacific, North Atlantic as well, um, it looks like the kelp forests around um, southern Patagonia it seem like they may fare better than others heading towards 2100. Also, it looks like Western Australia may do okay as well. Can't say the same for Tasmania. But um, there is some hope for some of these kelp forests, especially if um, we maintain the diversity and reduce the local stressors. And then we have to deal with climate change, obviously, at a global scale. Okay. Um, we had the pleasure of going to French Joseph Land, the most northern bit of land in Eurasia. This was a stopping off point for the early explorers in the late 1800s who were trying to find the North Pole. Since the um, Russian Revolution in 1917, no expeditions who were non-Russian were allowed to go up there until ours. So we did a joint expedition with the um, Russian Academy of Sciences, went to French Joseph Land, um, went throughout the archipelago, some of the um, most northern kelp forests in the world, 82 degrees north. Far north as we got, pretty close to the North Pole. Um, and sea surface temperatures of minus one. Um, I got frostbite, but all the other animals seem to be doing quite well. Um, so despite the fact that it's what we would consider a fairly inhospitable environment, uh, life thrives even at minus one. And uh, there was an article in National Geographic magazine that came out called um, The Meaning of North about our expedition. And this photo is kind of emblematic of what's going on in the Arctic um, and French Joseph Land in particular. The Arctic is warming faster than most other parts of the planet. And so this place should be just covered in ice right now, even in the summertime. Um, and the polar bear is just clinging on to that one last little bit of ice that, that's there while all the other ice fields are melting around there. Um, as a side note, um, I've spent thousands of hours underwater with sharks and um, the scariest I've ever been is being chased out of the water by a polar bear. Um, they're smart and they're great swimmers. So as a result of our work and working with the uh, um, Russian Geographical Society and the Russian Arctic National Park, they were able to create the uh, or expand the Russian Arctic National Park to include French Joseph Land Archipelago at 74,000 square kilometers. So big thing. Um, that was That is to this day the largest marine park in Russia, and up until recently was the largest park in the Arctic. Okay, um, the deep sea is largely a mystery. Um, we don't know much about it. Uh, with the help of National Geographic, we have uh, developed these deep water drop cameras that have been to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, and more importantly, back again. Um, so these allow us the opportunity to explore the deep sea relatively easily. Typically, you need a large oceanographic vessel uh, if you're going to explore, you know, in thousands of meters of depth. We've developed these fairly simplistic tools that um, are about the size of a beach ball. They can be deployed off the side of a Zodiac, and they're baited. They can stay down for as long as we program for, typically about 12 to 14 hours and we can see what's going on in the deep sea. And you see just amazing things that you didn't know down there. 2,000 meters in Hawaii, you see the cutthroat eels, uh, giant chimeras, rat tails, off the coast of Colombia, 2,600 meters, uh, deep sea skates, rat tails, these prickly sharks in Hawaii, pink snappers in Niue. So it's been an amazing tool to be able to survey the deep sea relatively easily without having large oceanographic vessels. So, what have we learned from swimming around and surveying these last wild places in the ocean? Five basic things come to mind for me. They're dominated by large predators, whether it's sharks or jacks or other animals, depending on what ecosystem you're at. They are typified by having iconic species, whether it's polar bears or whales or other things that we think of as, as iconic, but have been extirpated in many places. Endemic species, since many of these remote 
last wild places are remote. They tech to harbor species that are found nowhere else on Earth, making them very unique and important. Architectural species, whether it's a kelp forest or a coral reef or a seagrass bed, mangroves, these species are biotic things that provide the three-dimensional structure that allows for the complete extent of biodiversity that we see within these ecosystems. Whoop, sorry. And then finally, which is the hardest thing to quantify is the intactness of the ecosystem. And despite the fact that we've been collecting data in lots of places, lots of different ways, it's more of a gestalt. When you jump in the water, you just kind of know that it's natural and it's really hard to put your finger on it. But a place like this off of Clipperton Atoll in, um, in the tropical eastern Pacific is just, there's a lot going on and it just seems like it's natural. Okay, so what are the biggest threats to the ocean? The seafood industry um, is $150 billion a year, making it the largest food, the largest value food commodity on earth. Um, unfortunately, IUU, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing is the biggest short-term contemporary threat to the oceans. Um, there are literally tens of thousands of, of offshore vessels out there plying the waters and uh, distant water fleets in the high seas. Uh, one company in China alone owns, owns over a thousand vessels. So the extent and the magnitude and the efficiency of fishing right now is greater than the ocean can bear. Um, most high seas fisheries lose money. So it begs the question, how and why are they doing it? Egregious subsidies take place from a lot of nations slave labor as well. Inhumane working conditions are additional reasons that allow these fisheries to persist even though they're all losing money. So it's, it's really, um, you know, bad. But um, there is hope. Uh, cutting edge technology has kind of evened the playing field a little bit. Um, Global Fishing Watch, if you can hop on your phone right now, and there's about 70,000 fishing boats out there plying the waters around the ocean. Many of them have AIS, automated information system, and you can track most of the boats in the ocean. The big players are China, Japan, and Spain, Korea as well to a lesser degree. But um, you can see where these large scale industrial boats are fishing around the world. They're um, working with Google and other smart people using you know, uh, machine learning and AI to try to figure out like when boats are turning off and on their AIS when they're complying, when they're not complying. There's global agreements in place now, the port states measure. If you do something bad in one country, you can be denied access to another. So there are you know, international tools in place right now that are trying to deal with, with this. And um, whether it's satellite technology or radar technology, there are ways to track vessels, even vessels that don't have transponders on them. Lastly, um, Governments are starting to wise up that these are becoming national security risks. Um, boats that are fishing illegally, if you're doing one thing illegally, chances are you're going to do something else. So arms running, drug running, human trafficking are often taking place at the same time that illegal fishing is taking place. Also, some of these vessels are hybrid vessels that are also doing clandestine surveillance for their national governments. So a lot of countries are taking notice of this and it's starting to be an issue and which I think is a good thing in the long run. The biggest long-term threat is climate change. Um, global warming, ocean temperatures are warming globally, the ocean is becoming more acidic. In the case of coral reefs, um, when coral, when oceans get too warm, corals have symbiotic algae that live inside them. That's what gives them their color. When the water gets too warm, they expel those algae. That's why the corals turn white. It's called bleaching. If they don't re reacquire them over a period of time, then the corals end up dying, particularly if they don't have a lot of herbivores around. So the surgeon fish and the parrotfish are the lawn mowers of the reef. If they're there, they can keep the algae at bay while the corals try to recover. But Climate change is going to be the biggest long-term threat to not only coral reefs, but just marine ecosystems as a whole. But there is some hope. Um, our work in Kiribati in the Southern Line Islands has shown that reefs can be resilient to climate change. And what some people are referring to as super reefs. 
um, in 2009, we went to uh, the Southern Lion Islands of Kitabas, and we saw incredibly healthy reefs with high coral cover, lots of fish, amazing place. In 2015, the temperatures exceeded the threshold by 15 weeks, called degree heating weeks, and all the corals bleached, and half of all the corals died. But by 2021, when we went back, all the corals had recovered. You get a different suite of species in there than you had initially, but you know nothing's static. Everything's evolving over time. But if you take care of the local stressors, these um, you know global stressors, at least we can deal with while, and it just buys us some time while we deal with the ultimate issue of, of climate change. Um, this coral core down there from a, a parietes, a big massive coral, where we took a, a drill and core down into the coral. These are slow growing corals, but you can see the um, mortality scar from the 2016. Uh, bleaching event, but the coral has been able to resheat and regrow. So again, if you take care of the local stressors, reefs do have the ability to rebound. Okay, um, marine protected areas are great. They're important. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, less than 3% of the ocean is currently protected from fishing in uh, highly protected or fully protected marine protected areas. And most of those are in a small number of extremely large marine protected areas. So why can't we move the dial? There seems to be this disconnect between fisheries and conservation. Um, marine protected areas can be a tool for biodiversity conservation, but also can be a tool for fisheries. Um, fisheries you know, don't live in isolation. Marine protected areas don't live in isolation either. They, they both are important components of healthy oceans, but it's not an either or scenario. We need to have both. There is a global agreement in place now. In the Montreal meetings of the COP um, a few years ago, there was an agreement, a uh, framework to protect global biodiversity by 2030. So protecting 30% of land and 30% of the oceans by 2030. So <coughs> excuse me, there's been a commitment by most of the countries around the world to try to achieve those goals. But it's not just about protecting 30%. It's about protecting the right 30%. So what is the right 30%? Um, we recently published a paper in Nature where we looked at what, how to protect the ocean for biodiversity, food, and climate. We looked at biodiversity for a number of different species, seamounts, biogeographic provinces, and looked at the threats. And we came up with maps, maps for biodiversity, maps for food, and maps for carbon stocks. And these are the places that we would want to protect and give the highest priority to if we wanted to protect each of those. We combine them all, so if you've got a win-win scenario for all three of those. Surprisingly enough, um, which hadn't been looked at before, trawling uh, remineralizes a huge amount of carbon on the shelves, a lot of continental shelves around the world. Um, it's equivalent to about um, the same, it's about 6% of the global carbon, which is equivalent to the av aviation industry. So not huge, but not trivial. So if you stop trawling on all the oceans, um, they would be a much better absorptive sponge for carbon. Likewise, you know, we can increase fisheries and food production if we target the right protected areas. But also we have to look into, you know, futuristic planning. So what's the world going to look like in 2050? We've identified areas. <coughs> We've identified areas that are irreplaceable and important now, but also that will be in 2050 based on climate scenarios, movement of different species, resilience of ecosystems. So the, the, the extreme red there identifies the top 10% of places that are important now, but that are also important by 2050. Um, so those where we should target our efforts for the most part. And they exist everywhere around the world, Western Australia, Northern Australia, South American continent, North American continent. There's plenty of places that we can protect that will help us now and help us into the future. Okay, so it's not only the amount, but the level of protection that's important. And it greatly influences the future states of the ocean. Uh, as I hopefully highlighted, the oceans of the past were incredibly bountiful, full of large predators, large fish, healthy ecosystems on the bottom. Uh, the oceans of today 
not only are unhealthy, but they don't provide the ecosystem services that we expect from them, shoreline protection, food provisioning, you know, cultural perpetuation, all the things that we expect from healthy oceans. The only way we're going to get there is we have fully and strongly marine protected areas. Having protected areas that are either lightly protected or minimally protected are good for certain management strategies, but they're not going to help us uh, achieve the goals that we ultimately want to have healthy oceans and sustainable societies well into the future. And I think that'll do it. I think that um, I'm just following this increases and they've had to adjust the y-axis twice and I think it's like average 1.4 degree like breaking all models they've had before can you kind of comment on what's happened like July August September and how that changes the way you've maybe previously looked at the sustainability of the ocean and I, I noted your point on all of the plants that we also rely on. Right. I mean, it doesn't just seem to be in the North Atlantic, although North Atlantic is ridiculously off the scales, but um, I think it just increases their sense of urgency to do something. Um, this is probably not an anomaly, although it's now the new year, but um, the trajectories are such that, you know, each projection each year gets re, um, you know, re examined and changed upward. And so, yeah, I think it just increases our sense of urgency that we need to act now. Thanks, Alan. Any commentary on the indigenous wisdom, which might have affected uh, positively our knowledge? Right. I, uh, I didn't address that in this talk. I um, need to give me a couple more hours. But um, <laughs> yes, um, so I've been working a lot with Native Hawaiian and Pacific Island communities for a long, long time, and recognizing the wealth of knowledge in, in Hawaii. Um, there's been a lot, there's been a renaissance of traditional knowledge and accepting that as a valid scientific method to use for not only monitoring but managing resources. Like that, for Papa Namokote in Hawaii, there's a Native Hawaiian working group, there's Native Hawaiian science that's being conducted. Um, a lot of it is, is education and melding traditional and Western science. So a lot of our expeditions in recent years for the early parts of the years of the Cincy with National Geographic, we went to remote places where there weren't people. Um, we are engaging more with local communities on all the expeditions that we've conducted this year. We've had um, local researchers, local scientists, local elders on board with us. So there, um, we, and we don't call it capacity building anymore. It's really capacity sharing, right? There's like that exchange of values and ideas that takes place. Last summer we were in the Canadian Arctic and we had a lot of elders with us on the expedition, that wealth of knowledge that exists. So yeah, trying to document that and incorporate that into conservation planning is becoming more respected and resolved now. Um, but it's unfortunate it's taken so long to recognize that thousands of years ago people figured a lot of this out. Right. Um, hard to generalize in country per se. I can think of you know a couple places like in the North Pacific, um, just salmon fishery in the U.S. is being done well. Some some of the fisheries in Australia are being managed pretty well as well. Uh, I think what we have to recognize is the amount of effort and data and time and money that needs to go in to manage fisheries properly is, is a challenge in itself. So for some high value single species fishery, they can be managed well because we know the inputs and outputs. For most fisheries, particularly fisheries in the tropics or small scale fisheries, they're data poor. Um, we, there are dozens if not hundreds of species in the fishery. And so the best way to manage those is more spatially rather than conventional fisheries management. Conventional fisheries management was you know, designed 100 years ago to deal with cod 
in, in the North Sea, right? And so that was good, right? There was one thing getting pulled out, and when they got smaller, we should stop fishing. And it was fairly simplistic. The, the mathematics has become much more elegant over time, but um, they it tends to have lost its way a little bit and not recognizing the broader ecosystem impact. So I don't want to, you know, highlight specific countries or specific fisheries, but there are well-managed fisheries, and, and they should continue to be well-managed, but they have to be viewed in the broader context of the whole ecosystem. So looking at protecting the high seas, if we want to achieve 30% of global protection of our oceans, we're going to have to look at beyond national borders. How do we achieve that? Yeah. Um, it's a good point. Um, like I said, most high, high seas fisheries lose money, and most of those fisheries go to high value um, developed country markets. So it's not really about food security at that point. And in fact, um, uh, some analysis that was done showed that if a lot of the Pacific Island countries banded together, so they, many Pacific Island countries recently banded together and formed kind of a tuna cartel called the Party for the Narrow Agreement. And they've dramatically increased their revenue. So rather than doing bilateral agreements with, with China or with Korea or with Japan, um, they, they allocated vessel days and things like that, and they've dramatically increased uh, their, their revenue and their value. Um, for many Pacific Island countries, it's their own source of revenue, is tuna. Um, although the geopolitics is coming into play now for the Pacific Islands now, which is very interesting. But um, if they banded together even more and said, we should stop all high seas fishing, we can only fish in our work, their revenues would go up even more, and they have leverage to do that. Um, again, the geopolitics come into play. Um, but yes, I agree. Um, uh, close, oh, we also have to be careful a little bit about just closing the high seas and then going home and declaring victory, right? Because many, um, you know, much, it's not just about achieving 30%, it's about achieving the right 30% and for whom. So, um, you know, we need to consider coastal communities. Um, we will we'll benefit from closure, even though it seems counterintuitive to some fishing communities. I just had a question. I mean, we have some issues here in Western Australia, but I'll use somewhere like maybe Reunion Island as an example. Um, obviously, what you've shown is top predators are really important to ecosystems. But when there's growing populations and growing conflict in the world, when there's an incident with a top predator and a human, how do we manage that? And we would expect if we protect the ocean more that there would be a rise in incidents. How do we manage that and keep from big reactions that, 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 that are detriment to those efforts over many years? Yeah, and the bull sharks in the union are from kind of upset the apple cart a little bit, right? Um, but even people. Um, yeah, as, as um, you know, we, we have a fair amount of shark incidents every year in Hawaii. I've been working on shark depredation because other than just attacks on humans, depredation of damaging fishing gear and fish catch has become a big issue. And as more shark sanctuaries and more marine protectors come in place, shark populations are increasing in certain areas. You know, we, we kill millions and millions of sharks every year and they kill a few people every year. Um, so it is a bit of an occupational hazard to go surfing or swimming in, in the water to some degree. But much more dangerous to get in your car, um, drive around. But, um, yes, it's certainly an issue. I think public awareness, education are part of it. Um, you know, we don't want to go back to the days of calling because um, it didn't seem like that worked. In Hawaii back in the 1970s, there was a big calling and it, um, and it killed, you know, several thousand tiger sharks and it didn't affect the interactions, the frequency of interactions between sharks and people, people at all. So, um, yeah, it's tough, right? Because anytime there's an incident, there wants to be retribution or reaction to that. And hopefully, you know, saner minds are now, there's, you know, greater public education. But I agree, it's difficult. I think Collins also just demonstrates the value of having uh, international education for the scale of the That's a valid question for you, Sean. 
Um, I just wanted to ask, so with like corals being able to rebound, would you think that, let's say, taking corals from more resilient countries, because I come from Singapore and I know that our corals are pretty resilient. So what if we take those corals and introduce them to a different area, which is facing really bad coral bleaching? Right, so um, coral forming has been a popular activity in a lot of places around the world recently to try to, um, you know, basically take small fragments of coral and then try to outplant them. If you look, it doesn't really scale, right? So, um, I, you know, a lot of people working on um, are there resilient corals? There are certain genetic um, variants that are more resilient than others that we can move from one place to another. It's always challenging to, you know, outguess or overguess nature. But more importantly, the scale of things, we um, did a little back of the envelope exercise where if you wanted to calculate how much it would cost to grow corals, uh, plant them, and excluding even the mortality that would exist in them, it would be on the order of millions to tens of millions of dollars per square kilometer of reef. And I don't think anybody prepared to spend that kind of money to, you know, try to transplant coral in a reef, especially the high likelihood that many of them are going to die. So it's, I don't want to say it's a feel good exercise, but I think we need to deal with the root problems if there's some more climate change. I guess on that topic of dealing with the root problem on climate change, um, I just wanted to talk about maybe asking you your opinion on how we would better communicate with governments and increase the sense of sense of urgency to actually start dealing with climate change. I know, like for decades in the past, you know, scientists have been warning governments and government agencies that uh, climate change is impacting biodiversity. Say, take coral reefs for example. Um, we have all these bleaching impacts. Yes, the corals do rebound, but as you were saying the bi fundamental biodiversity on those coral reefs are changing as a result. And then with continual sort of increasing temperatures, these reefs are subject to bleaching bomb, bleaching bomb, bleaching events, like decreasing their chances of bouncing back later. So how do we as scientists use our knowledge and try and enact more urgent change from governments? <laughs> I wish I knew the answer. <laughs> Yeah, it's, um, I think the other gentleman about the sense of urgency that we need to talk about, uh, probably making it a monetary issue, whether it's livelihoods or food security, um, social cohesion. I think all the things that we talk about are important. Um, you know, we should take off our academic hats occasionally and think about what it means to other people and how that would resonate. You know, if we're talking to a politician, we have to think about how that person the constituency that that person is responding to and figure out what are the motivators and what's important to that constituent, his constituency, his or her constituent. But yeah, um, it's difficult, right? We've been, you know, talking about this for a long time and it only seems to be more accelerating by the day. The six and a half million square kilometers that you've added in protecting, are they full no-take MPAs? And if they are, how do you go about ensuring compliance and these remote areas actually not fished, like coming up in the future where there's not many fish going in other areas? Yeah, for the most part, they have been complete no-take um, up until this point. Um, our model is changing, like I mentioned, to more engaging with communities and looking more at multi-purpose and, um, and supporting local government efforts. Um, and back in the day, we were pretty much just finding the last wild places and um, getting access to governments uh, where there weren't people. But um, so compliance is difficult. We were working with Global Fishing Watch. Um, so there is monitoring. And they were working with the individual governments to develop their own monitoring systems. And um, that thing. The port states measures um, are, are ways, look, no, it, it's all imperfect, right, especially for many of these remote areas. But the best we can do is uh, develop, you know, enhance technologies, work with people who have those technologies, and, um, and then work with governments. Um, like some, we just came from back from the Marshall Islands. Um, 
tuna is big money there. When we went to the fisheries office, uh, the fisheries office, one floor was, looked like NASA's mission control center. They had screens everywhere. They know where all the boats are operating within their exclusive economic zone. So they've got a, a vested economic interest in making sure that poaching's not happening because they've actually got poachers in recent years and uh, pretty significant fines were levied. And the impetus for countries to pay those fines is it's still lucrative fishing in those waters. So um, it's a bit of a cat and mouse game, but um, it's the best we can do. So um, Alan, partially as a nod to the very elegant work that you did um, just a few years ago in uh, the Hawaiian Islands and in, and in Palmyra, I mean, they show so clearly and on massive large scale that protection works and remoteness works. What do you think, so we've been telling the story about, you know, biodiversity benefits, possible fisheries benefits for a very long time. What do you think is the key argument that we need to use to speak to those constituencies to drive more protection? Is there a key argument? Again, not an yeah. easy question to answer. Well, I get the last one. Because <laughs> if you had the answer, hopefully it would have moved the, the dial at this point. Um, I think the arguments need to be more about um, sustainability at a global scale. So food security, first and foremost, is what we need to think about. Um, there are, you know, there's a carbon market now, right? There's carbon credits. We're just looking into blue carbon as far as um, if we've got healthy, you know, if we've got a healthy marine protected area, are there actually carbon benefits being accrued? And if so, who's ever established that protected area should get those credits. Biodiversity credits don't exist at present. That market doesn't exist. It could be a while, but um, in the case of the country of Niue, they um, created um, conservation credits in the sense that you can go online right now and buy a square kilometer of EEZ within the country of Niue for a few hundred dollars. So it's more philanthropy at this point, but at least that helps that small country um, generate revenues to manage its large scale marine protected area. So it's, it's a couple different things. You know, uh, creating marine protected areas, there's costs associated with it. But I think we need to flip the burden of proof on its head and say, what are our costs for inaction? Um, lack of food security, lack of jobs, lack of cultural cohesion. Uh, those are the, the things that would resonate with people. So um, again, it's, it's hard to really put an exact number or, or an exact mechanism for doing that. But those are the general arguments that I would make. All right, well, thank you very much, Alan. Um, I'd like to have everybody join in thanking him for a wonderful uh, lecture this evening. Thank you. And um, I was earlier, I was remiss. Um, putting together a lecture like this is not a trivial thing, let alone the entire two weeks of activities. So I just want to also thank Vivian and Cora and Melissa and Tara and Virginia um, from uh, Oceans Institute Development Office Forest uh, Research Foundation, who've helped make my life so much easier by pulling together a wonderful event. And of course, the last people I need to thank again so much are Chu Chi and Mei Wen for having the vision to drive academics to have impact. So thank you.